If you're taking notes today and you insist on having a title, <laughs> my title would be the this. It would be desire, the word desire, the driving force that maximizes your impact in his kingdom. Hmm. Desire. I know many of us, we don't hear that word very often. And we don't think about that, but I just want to take a few moments today and talk with you about it. It's def defined this way, the word desire, to long for or to crave, to wish or to want something that brings satisfaction or enjoyment. It compels you to attain. That's what desire does. Compels you to attain. It drives you and it causes you to move onward. Another word for desire could be passion. But we can mix those two together this morning in this setting. The opposite of the word desire would be apathy, absence of passion, emotion, and excitement. Absence of emotion and absence of of excitement. You see, there's all kinds of desires. There could be some ladies in the room who would say, oh, fresh cut flowers would be my desire. And someone next to you would say, no, chocolates are my desire. Or you could be like my wife that Flowers or chocolates really don't matter. And she'd have something else. She doesn't like chocolate. Doesn't like sweets. There could be someone in here that maybe their desire would be a Big Mac. And then the next guy would say, no, a steak from Texas Cattle Company would be my desire. There could be a young person in here that may want a bicycle, have a desire for a bicycle. With Christmas coming up, maybe it's on the list. But then somebody else would say, no, I want a black Audi R8 5.2 plus coupe. That's what mine is at. <laughs> there could be a young lady in the room or maybe even an older lady that says, well, my desire would be if I could just find a good guy to date. Someone else would say, no, I want a good guy to marry. And that's okay. So there's all kinds of desires. There's good desires, and we know there's wicked desires. There's natural desires. How many of you know, listen to what I'm about to say. How many of you know that it's always better to do something that you want to do or have the desire to do rather than to be forced to do something. Hmm. <laughs> it's always better. It's easier. It's more enjoyable to do those things that we want to do, have passion for. Some of you came to church today because you had to. And then there are some that came because they wanted to. Maybe you drove a long way today. And you came expecting and you were excited and you had passion and you had desire to be here. We talked earlier about how many of you ate too much and Will stood up and raised both hands. And I was thinking about that. I have him helping me lose some weight. And for those that have not noticed, I've lost about 10, 12 pounds. Yeah. And that's okay. And I'm still working on it. But uh, I mean, you know, it's better to lose weight because you want to than to go to the doctor and have him tell you that you're going to lose weight or else that or else <laughs> talk about will drive you it will motivate you to get going. But until you want to be healthier, you'll hate eating all those vegetables. All those fruits that you're supposed to eat. You won't want to give up those sodas and those french fries and all that junk food. Someone put it this way. 
Love the passion more than the pain. Love the passion more than the pain. So today I want to talk to you about godly desire. I want to talk to you about passion for God. We have all these different desires that's in our lives and, and they're good and they're okay and some of them maybe are not so good or are evil or wicked or whatever. But I want to talk to you today just briefly about godly desire and the importance of having godly desire inside of you. You see, in comparison with all of the other desires, our passion for God should far exceed all of our other passions. Far exceed. We were uh, here the other night and we were having the uh, marriage night and we were watching a DVD and uh, the guy on the DVD said this. He said that you must love God more than you love your wife and your children. And um, he used the example of being on an airplane and the, when the oxygen pressure changes and the masks drop out and the, flight, uh, the instructor on the plane will tell you to put your mask on first and then put your mask on your children. And, you know, for some not thinking, I'm like, oh no, we gotta, we gotta save our kids. We gotta, you know, we gotta put it on our kids, hurry up. But the point is, is that you're no good to put a mask on your kid if you're dead, if you're not breathing. And so in comparison, to our wives and our children, and, and he went through the list of church and, and ministry and all that kind of stuff, our love for God has to far, far, far exceed. Almost, well, in comparison, would almost seem like hatred. It's not in human terms, but compared in spiritual terms, our passion for God should be that high. That high. And so, as far as having godly passion, godly desire, number one, it's because it's right. It's because it's a command. Deuteronomy 6, 5 says, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your strength. Luke 10, 27, love the Lord your God with all of your heart. He puts it this way, all of your soul, all of your strength, and all of your mind, and then love your neighbor as yourself. How many of you think that the word all means all in these passages? And the second reason is, is that it keeps us in the center of his will for our life. You see, when you love God... You want to do things that please Him and you want to obey Him and it's the obedience to Him that directs His will for your life. You see, when you do things, when you make choices that are pleasing to Him, it's those choices that you make that move you into His will for your life or takes you away. From his will for your life. You see, desire is the thing that drives you into your destiny. It catapults you into his will for your life. I was remembering, um, I have Austin, my son, here with me and his wife and our grandson. And um, I was remembering um, when we, I took him to Africa and he was rather young and... Uh, we went out there to do some meetings and so on and so forth. But when I used to fly to and from Africa as a kid, I used to always request to go into the cockpit of the plane. And uh, in those days, they would actually allow you to do so. And there would be times that I would go into the cockpit, be invited by the pilot to come into the cockpit. Um, 
during a flight. It could be on a layover, whatever. I can remember I would sit up in there and, and um, they had, now we're not talking about two-seater planes here. We're talking about 747s and DC-9s and things like that. How many of you know what a DC-9 is? Okay. It's got three engines. It's about as big as a 747. Doesn't hold quite that many. But three engines, one on each wing and one in the tail. You know that that plane can fly with one engine? If two engines go out, it doesn't matter which one. It can still fly with one. That, that was a side note. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I just for those of you that are airplane enthusiasts. Um, but I used to go up into the into the cockpit and I would set their nautical miles on their uh, dials. What you do is you set it if you're going to fly, let's say 857 miles, you set it for that, and then as you fly, it ticks down, tick down, 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 down to zero when you arrive. And so anyway, I used to do that. So when I took him to Africa, I wanted him to experience that um, like I did. So we got on the plane and I told the flight attendant, back then they were called stewardesses, now they're flight attendants. And um, I said, if it would be possible, I'd like to go up into the cockpit with my son. If you would just let the pilot know, I would appreciate that. So we sat, we sat on the plane, and um, they never came and got us. And uh, so I thought, well, maybe not, you know. And so we were <laughs> flying back from Africa, and we were in flight, and the flight attendant came back and said, uh, the pilot has asked for you to come up to see him. So I got Austin, I said, hey, this is our chance, we get to go. And so we actually went up, and, and uh, I don't those of you that have never been in there, you walk in, and there's a jump seat over here on the left, and there's another seat over here for the navigator, and then there's two seats for the pilot, and there's instrument panels. I mean, buttons and lights and, and above, and then you've got this windshield that goes all the way around. So you can see all the way around from one side to the other. So we're at 33, 34,000 feet, and it was a clear day, and you can actually look down and see the waves of the Atlantic Ocean, white caps. Now they look about this tall, so you can imagine how big they are when you get right next to them. But we sat up in the cockpit and we visited with the pilot and you know, asked him where, he, where they were from and, and all of that kind of stuff. But the, the, the reason I'm saying this to you is when you get up into that into that cockpit, those engines just are forcing you through the air with, I mean, I'm talking, you can feel them behind you because here's this long plane that's behind you with wings and tail and all of that. And these engines are just thrusting you and catapulting you through the air. And that's the way desire is. Desire is what thrusts you into his will. It leads you. It, it directs you. It moves you from where you are to where he wants you to be. And it's a process. It's not a one-step deal and, and, and once it, you take your step, you're there. No, no, no. It's a process, step by step by step, as he leads you into his will. So if you want all that God has for you, it requires this unrelenting passion or desire for God. You're not going to be a mediocre Christian and reach your full potential for Him. It's not going to happen. It will not happen. And there are many, many, many people in the church in different parts of the world, we call them nominal Christians who are just drifting. Oh, uh, the wind blows over here. Oh, the wind blows over here. So go over here. No, 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 no. And they don't do anything for God because they don't have any passion for Him and don't let His desires get inside of you and move you to, to the will that He has for you. Hmm. Matthew 16, 24 says this, If anyone desires to be my disciple, let him deny himself, disregard, lose sight of, and forget 
himself and his own interests and desires and take up his cross and follow him. That's what it requires, laying it all down. Many people aren't willing to lay it all down. They won't lay down their desires. They have their ambitions. They have their goals. They won't even, there's no way. And some of their desires are very good, but they're not willing to lay them down. I'm telling you, in order to do everything that God has for you to do, you're going to have to lay every single one down. Every single one down. Even the good ones. You may have a desire here to be on the worship team or play an instrument. Or you may even have a desire to be a missionary or lead some kind of prayer movement or do some kind of ministry for God. That's totally awesome. But it can't, you can't have that desire higher than obeying God. You can't. You say, well, you know, I don't think that God would ever ask me to lay it down. Really? You don't think so? Abraham had to. Abraham loved God, was promised by God a son, waited many years for that son, many years, and then was asked to sacrifice that son. And was willing to do it. The Bible says that he got up early the next morning and took the donkey and the sun and the fire and the knife and went. He didn't sleep in. He didn't say, well, you know, I need to pray about it for a week and see if this is really God. No, 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 no. He got up early the next morning and traveled. What about Joseph? Joseph had dreams from God. Dreams from God. That he was going to be a leader. And yet he had to go to prison. And sold into slavery. Still had to believe that those dreams came from God. And that in his timing. That they would come to pass. You see there's something that I tell people all over the world. When I speak to them. Especially the younger people. And that is this. In the mornings when I get up, before I even get out of bed, I give all of my desires to Him in exchange for His. I tell Him, God, you know what? I, I'm going to give you all of my dreams, all of the ways that I think my life should go, and the ways that I think you should do things for me. I'll lay all those, I'm going to give all of those to you in exchange for your desires that you have for me and for my life. And when I get those inside of me, I will make choices. I will walk in a way that will lead me into his perfect will. And people will ask me, well, I, well you know, I don't know what God's will for my life is. You know, I... I I, I just, I haven't heard from God. I, you know, I, I'm just uncertain. Just walk with God. Walk with Him every day. He's not going to lead you down a path that isn't in His plan. He's not going to do that. So if you get His desires inside of you, that will lead you to what He has for you. Simply by making the right choices. You see, until you're willing to lay it all down, you truly can't pick up all of his desires that he has for you. Until you're w willing to let go of it all, all of your wants, all of your plans, all of your ideas on how you think God should do things, all of your dreams, until after total surrender and willingness to lay it all down, then God hands you His desires and you're able to carry them through your life. You say, well, you know, I just have some of these desires that I just don't. I know they're not right. 
I know they're not pleasing to him. Maybe they could be bad habits or addictions of some kind. The great thing about it is that God, he wants to put his desire inside of you. And on top of that, he's even willing to help do that. According to his scripture, Psalm 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you those desires. And here's one I absolutely love. Philippians 2, 13. For it is God working in you and giving you the desire to obey him and the power to do what pleases him. You see, you don't have to do things in your own strength. You can actually rely on him and his strength. He's willing to help you. He's willing to put those things <clears throat> inside of you. Another thing that causes lack of desire in people is their circumstances in life. We see this in the church quite often. When people will be on fire for God, you know, Worship God, be a part, and then something happens in their life and then they exit. You don't see them again. You don't hear from them or if you do, they're, they're totally messed up. Can you maintain and can you fulfill all that God has for you even when you don't understand what's happening to you in life? You may be here today and you may say, well, why does God have me where he has me? I just, it's, it's a difficult time in my life and I've gone through so much and I'm, I'm, just, I'm just not sure about it. Why is this happening to me? I mean, was remembering when I was a teenager in, in Africa. It was a year and nine months when I first went. Um, but... I was, I remember specifically when I was a teenager, all those, that teenage mindset. And some of you are in it, and some of your parents have kids that are in it, and, and it's challenging, and, and there's things going on inside of you, and you're in your shit, you're beginning to shift from being a child to moving more on your own and being more independent, and so on and so forth. And, and, um, I went to a, a rather strict boarding school um, that I did not agree with all the, the rules that they had. How many of you want to hear a stupid rule from my boarding school? <laughs> okay, now, now, now check this out. You gotta get a picture. When, when you go on the mission field like we did, we would go for four years at a time, okay? So you can imagine as if you were a parent, and you got to go to Walmart and you have to buy clothes for your child for the next four years. Okay, you have to buy shampoo for the next four years. You have to buy toilet paper for the next four years. Okay, so here we try to buy for four years to take. And then the stupid thing, the rule, is that you're not allowed to wear jeans to class that have double seams on them. Okay, so you're going to look at your jeans. You've got double seams right there. Yeah, you can't wear those. Now, you can wear single seam, and you can wear triple seam, but you can't wear double seam. How I many of you think that that's stupid? But... It, it, overall, it was a good school and taught me discipline and all that. It was just some things that I didn't like. I just, I, it, there was just rules that I didn't like. But as I was a teenager, I was, I was faced with the decision, am I going to rebel or am I going to go along with, with where God has me? And I had a lot of friends that rebelled and, and got themselves into a lot of trouble. And, uh, and I would tell them, listen, just... I know you don't agree with it, but just go along with it. Put in your time. 
and when it's time to leave the school, you don't have to do all this stuff the rest of your life. You don't have to, you, you know, you don't have to implement that into your life. Just go along with it, you know, and they're like, no, I'm, I'm going to, no, I'm not going to do it. And they get themselves in all kinds of trouble. And I would tell them, I'd say, listen, the day that I leave this school, I'm going to go into the cafeteria and I'm going to be happy and I'm going to say goodbye to all of my friends and I'm going to be leaving and I'll put in my time. You know all of those rebellious kids who fought it day after day after day, hated it, couldn't stand it, wasn't right, you know, how dare they and all this stuff. When it came for their last day, they bawled and squalled and, oh, I can't believe I'm my time here. Like, I just love it here so much and all this stuff. They totally flipped. They totally flipped. And I went through the cafeteria and shook hands and hugged people and, it was great, and I put in my time, and, and that was it. But there were such stupid rules that we had to go by. But I was faced with a choice, what am I going to do? And so, and I would spend time with God, when I, especially when I would go home on vacation. Um, there was a, a man in the church that blessed our family with dirt bikes. And how many of you know dirt bikes in Africa really work well? And so, and, but I would go out. I would go out and spend hours riding my motorcycle, dirt bike, and just talking with God and saying, God, what do you have for me? I mean, I'm coming down to the wire. I'm, my time's going to be up in Africa. I'm going back to the state. What job do you want me to get? What what do you, where do you want me to go to school? You know, what do you, what do you have for me? And I wrestled with that and just talked with him about it because, it, you know, here you guys have McDonald's and you have grocery stores, all these places that you can work, but out there, you don't have it. So it's all really, really foreign to you when you get back here. But I just had to get to the place where I said, you know, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll, I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'll work wherever. It, it, it really doesn't matter. Let me just give you my desires and let, put yours inside of me. Put yours inside of me so they'll direct me. And so when things happen to you in life and, and, and you ask yourself, why am I here and why am I going through? My question to you is this. Can you push through and can you stay on track with God? When he's allowing very difficult things to happen to you. Can you do it? Can, can the passion that's inside of you for him push you through and lead you through where you don't disengage from God? Can you do that? Because there's a lot of people who can't do that. Who walk out these doors and never come back. And they turn their back on God. When in actual fact... Of all people to turn to is Him. Hmm. Turn their back on God. Even sickness comes. Difficult. These are difficult things. I'm not here to minimize them. For those of you that don't know, my wife and I, we had a daughter who lived for four months and, and passed away. And, and uh, I'll never forget the day and the time that she was actually passing away from this earth into heaven. A social worker came into the room and started giving us literature and statistics. And do you know that some, such and such percent of individuals that lose their child, they end in divorce? Certain percentage go to alcoholism. Then. I mean, they're naming all of this stuff, and we're sitting there thinking. And finally, I just, you know, I just had enough. I mean, I, I, I appreciate their job and what they do and all of that, but it just wasn't for me. It just wasn't for me. And I, we didn't understand how these things could happen and what God was doing and and all of that. But I just determined. God, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk with you. I, I may not understand. I may not see your full detailed plan that you have. But, but I choose today, in the midst of this difficult situation, and what an understatement that is, 
that I'm going to serve you and I'm going to love you with all of my heart and I'm going to obey everything that you tell me to do, whether it's, it's significant to me or not, I'm still going to obey and I'm still going to do what you tell me to do and I'm going to go where you lead me to go. The three Hebrew children had that same mentality when they weren't supposed to worship the king. They said, you know what? We're not going to bow. And we believe that our God is able. And we believe that he will. And even if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow. We're going to worship you, the true God. I'm asking you the question today. Do you have that passion inside of you? Do you have it? Because if you don't, if you don't, there's a rough road ahead. Someone said it this way. I'd rather have Jesus in the boat with me in the storm than have him out of my boat. Be determined that with God's help, you're not going to allow any circumstances to take away your passion and your desire for Him. Where do you stand today? You, you size up your life. You know, you know your passions. You know your desires. Where do you stand today? Have you realized that maybe something in this life has got more passion than God? There's all ages in here. It could be anything. And anything that stands between you and God, God's going to oppose it. He's going to come against it. He's not, he's not going to settle for it. Being second, he's not. Every head out bowed today. As you reflect on your life and your situation and your circumstances, I ask you a few questions. Have you given your desires to Him? Your ambitions, your dreams, even the good ones, the really good ones, the ones even that He gave you. Are you willing to lay those down and put Him first? Do you realize that when you embrace His desires for your life that He leads you into His perfect will? when you embrace his desires and you position yourself in God you're able at that point to reach your full potential for him have you allowed circumstances in your life to affect your passion for God maybe Something bad has happened and, and it's caused your affections to hint for him to grow cold. You see, each one of us today, we're faced with choices. And the choice here today is this. Are you going to hang on to what you want? Or are you willing to surrender it all to him? trade and exchange his for yours. See, there's many people that are not willing to do that. It's a sacrifice. But we've got to get to the point where we're 100% trusting him that he's going to lead us and he's going to direct us and he's going to catapult us. He's going to drive us into His perfect will. Everyone standing as we pray together. Kelly. 
I know today was different. I know I didn't take a long time. I'd rather you, I'd rather speak short and have you think about this all week long than to speak long and have you totally forget. Hmm. If you're here today in, in something that was said, maybe the Holy Spirit shined His flashlight on an area of your life that is off -site. I want to encourage you to come and stand here with me in the altar area. If you're here today and you're not saved and you're not a Christian and you don't believe in Jesus, and you may be here and you may have no desire for God. <clears throat> I want you to come stand with me. Nothing to be ashamed of. I urge you by the Holy Spirit, come and stand. If your walk with God may not even be existent, come and get right today. I'll pray with you. But if you're here today, you may have walked with God 50 years. I think I've got 47 years walking with God. That's meaningless. If my hunger and my passion for Him is non-existent or real small, it doesn't matter how long you walk with Him. But I want you to come. If the Holy Spirit is young, you may just have one thing that you need to tweak and get right with Him. You don't have to be up here a long time, but you do need to make it right. And so I want to encourage well, anybody want to come forward and join us. Come now. Come now. Before, before we transition, before we end this, just come now. Come now, separate yourself with God. Close yourself in with Him. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you whatever area needs to be tweaked. You may need to come and just say, Oh God, I'm sorry. I didn't realize it. I didn't realize that money or my occupation was so high on the list and even above you. I'm so sorry. Come now. Come now. What we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to go back into some worship. I want you all to join in and worship. When you're through, you're free to leave. Be quiet. I, I just ask you for those that are praying as we pray with them. I'd like the core team to come and help me pray with these that have come. Anyone else want to come before we transition?